don't know if you've done the Corona shave where you use your machine on just what's visible. And then at the back, there's still hair because <laughs> you have no time. Exactly, man. Corona shave in the house. I'm not the only one. <laughs> but that's, why, that's why I'm so impressed with your, with your haircut. I haven't been to... No, no man. It's, it's, it's chaos at the back, yo. It's oh, please just... show me. <laughs> yeah. Please show me. No, no, no. I just did that. There's still hair, man. And I was just like, what the hell? Oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> This is a beautiful start to the interview. And you start like reaching back, reaching back, and you're like, I don't know, is it there? I actually, what they need to make like an extendable uh, shaver with like, uh. dude. So you're not a you're not a head person. You have to shave. I have to. I mean, like, yeah. It's just once the hair started going, I was like, we need to we need to create some unity. We need to. I told, create some I told unity. you I'm lazy because once the hair starts growing for me. I just put on a hat. Just put on a hat. No man, but hats, I, you've got the head shape for a hat. I look terrible with hats. So hat was never really uh, an option. All right, bro, let me, let me begin this thing officially. For those listening, welcome to the Johannesburg International Comedy Festival catch up session. Now we would have traditionally had our festival, which is hosted in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa, but because of course of Corona, we have now decided to catch up with some of our artists that have been in the festival, one of which is now superstar. Is that a, is that a correct adjective to uh, to give to you? I'm a level three star. You know what I mean? Like superstar is like Kevin Hart, right? Okay. And then star is probably like you know uh, a bit lower down. And then there's me. So I'm not a superstar. You know what I mean? I'm there. Where I'll tell you what it is. When I go on tour, I sell out 500 seater, not an arena. Right? Arena is when you're a superstar. Dude, now tell me how that felt. Because the last time I saw you, yeah, you were Daliso Chaponda, comedian. You were living in, in the UK, right? And honestly, you were an act just doing the thing. And for yeah, me- I was just, I'd given into, I'm just a um, circuit act who yeah. just does clubs. I mean, I'd had a, opportunity that almost happened you know those almost famous yeah. 2008 and I missed it I didn't play it right and I was like ah oh, this is please me for the rest if you don't mind please can you tell us what that was or, or as okay, much as so, you can about that so this was interesting because I'd been like doing shows and stuff like that and I was seen in one year and I did the Melbourne festival and smashed it also did the Cape Town Festival and smashed it that year. And I got an offer from a big agent, right? Saying, hey, come over. And I don't know what I was thinking. I'd read too many romantic books. I was like, I have to be faithful to my agent, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're just like, you know, I can't, they, they, they took a risk on me and uh, all that nonsense you hear in movies. No, dump them. Go to the big one, chase the fame, chase the money. What was I thinking, right? So look, I, I'm not bad mouthing them. They did as much as they could, but I stayed with them as opposed to the person who had TV contacts, corporate contacts, and you know, famous acts in their stable. And I believed, oh, we're gonna get there together. And then like, that was 2008 by 2011. I was like, what did I do? <laughs> do <laughs> Calling you know, that agent you like- Anybody who joined that big agency during that time that you saw kind of uh everybody 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 who joined doing well everybody's joined doing well and i'm just like ah and i'm like trying to uh talk to them like trying to persuade your ex-girlfriend to get back together with you and the moment had gone because they were only interested in me that year when there was the heat and the fire and i'd been on this and i'd been on that and you know i was like okay i made a you know youthful mistake and but I wasn't grumpy. I liked my career because I was doing comedy clubs, which is it's the most fun job in the world, right? I just wasn't balling. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? I was just, some months the rent hurts. You know when you're giving it to the landlord and it hurts when they take it? You're holding you, have, you ever kept, have you ever kept money in your account? You know that it's time to pay, yes. but you just keep it in your account. Because yes! The idea you like of the number. number. You like the number. Oh, you love the number. You love the number, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and you know you're gonna have to you're gonna have to subtract this thing and then the numbers just not gonna be nice 
Oh, and it hurts. It hurts. And you're just like, for two days, I was rich. <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, so God. glad I'm not the only one. So you say no, 2008, to an opportunity that you were excited about, but because of loyalty and... Yes. Yeah. Oh, and just naivety, naivety. Because in my head, I was like, well, look, if you're hot, who cares what the agent is? It's your talent. Your right. talent's going to take you there. All that kind of stuff which people go, oh, it's a meritocracy. It doesn't matter. And right. it does matter. It does matter. Right? I, think, I think what I will ask you now yeah. is where, in terms of not even just your career, in terms of performance, but let's keep with the, with the representation and the behind yes. the scenes. So where are you now and how are you set up now compared to that 2008 when yes. you started? Yes, so... Um, I had a manager for two years. Now I've just got an agent, right? But both of these people had contact. So what it is, is when something happens in the news, like Black Lives Matter happens, okay, right? The TV stations need a black person to come on and talk about it, right? Oh, it's, I have a joke which I do now, which is totally true about whenever these racist things happen, it's kind of good for my career. So it's not like I want them to happen, but I... You know, I kind of do. <laughs> You're just kind of like, <laughs> no. But my point is, my point is on this jokes aside, is that with the previous agent, I would not be in their first phone call, right? So let's say the BBC or the ITV is like, ah, Black Lives Matter, get a black comedian pronto. They will call the top agents who's available. My agent now is on that list, so I get the call while I wouldn't have got the call. So it's more access to stuff like I've done radio and TV stuff. And it helps that you're funny and you're someone in their head, but there are lots of funny people in their head. So when you've got the representation, it just makes it easy because they're there putting your name forward, chasing stuff for you. I get auditions for stuff. Hey, I don't necessarily get the job, but I appreciate being able to try. You know, like I, I just did an audition in lockdown for like a, a kid's show. I didn't get it, but it's like, I wouldn't even have got the audition a few years ago. So it's more that the doors are open and then you have to smash them down. While previously you're on the outside saying, I'm funny, I really am. If someone could give me a shot. That's interesting. Looking back now, do you think that you were ready in, tw in 2018? Like, in, in, sorry, in, 20, in 20, 2008, eh? Yes. Now, I think it's a different thing. I, I was ready, but I would have been a very different kind of comedian. Mm -hmm. Right? Because back then I was like a comedian who was trying to be cool. My jokes were all about sex. My jokes were all about like uh, very surface stuff, which is fine. I would have been successful because I was funny. Yeah. And then now I developed and now I talk about politics and I have a uh, I talk about, um, you know, society and stuff like that. So I just became a different comedian who I don't think I would have become if I was successful back then because I would have been like, yeah, more glam, more glam. Let me wearing bling onto stage and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's so interesting, dude. And, yeah. then, and then bringing it back to, yes. kind of, uh, to kind of like international travel because you've been in the UK. Yes. How long? So I moved 2007, 2007. And, and yeah. just, sorry, just for background for people. Okay, so I'm Malawian, Malawian. Uh, I grew up all over the world because of, you know, refugee situations and stuff like that. And so grew up in many different countries. And then my dad was in the UN, so I was citizen of nowhere. And then I went to university in Canada, discovered comedy accidentally, didn't even know it existed, right? Performed there for a while, did just for last, but then had to leave the country because visa was up. You can't stay. I tried. They said, no, nope, you got to go. Went to South Africa. And it's very interesting. I was in South Africa when you were a fledgling circuit where literally it was just cool runnings, right? Wow. And it was, Wait, dude, what year was that? Because I don't. That was 2004, 5, 2004, 5, when there was nothing there. There was nothing there. And it was just one of those things where part of me, again, in my head, where I'm like looking at forks in the road. I should have had faith and just stuck it out. Because who? Did, I didn't know it was going to blow up. Same thing, right? I moved to, to this was so funny, because I moved to England, and I'm struggling in England. And all the people in South Africa who I had started out with, now all of them suddenly are doing well. And I'm like, 
I was I was there until things started to get good. What was I doing? What did I do? How long were you here for? As it was only like one year. It was only like one year, and I was living in my brother's extra room. I wasn't making money, right? And I was just like, "This is what am I doing here? What am I doing?" Did you jump and on stage at any point? I jumped on stage every, every day. No, I, every time I could. I did a lot. I did as much as was possible. Um, wow. But it was just, there wasn't much. It's really interesting. In the years between then and now, it's absurd the exponential growth that South Africa so then, had. So then, Dalisa, for you, does that mean, like, with your background of traveling and, and, and kind of inter international travel, does that make performing a little bit seamless? For you as opposed to like a, a regular comedian who stays in one place or is exposed yes to yes because like i don't even think of any place as my home right mm -hmm. because like i just move like i've not even lived here constantly i've lived here then i've gone i've lived somewhere for six months and i've lived somewhere for i just go wherever uh -huh. the job is right uh -huh. you know what i mean and i always say you know people say oh, where's home and like home is where my friends are so as long as you've got friends, my, my home could be Canada, my home could be Australia, my home could be South Africa, you know? Come on, bro. It's true. Yeah? Yeah. And then, so Johannesburg, by the time you were doing the festival here, it was a cinch for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I had, I had the South African material from when I lived there. And uh, also, I'll tell you the truth, South Africa isn't that far away from Malawi. Right. In terms of like the the culture, the stuff which people really enjoy. We've all got profits, right? We've all got load shedding. There's enough commonalities, like you know what I mean? Like um you I f actually feel more comfortable on a South African state than a British state. Right. Because I have to start in some way in every show I do in the UK explaining I'm from Africa, I'm from Malawi, this yeah. is Malawi. I don't yeah. need any of that nonsense in South Africa. Like one sentence and it's good. Also, I don't have the weirdest name on the bill in South <laughs> Africa. <laughs> Here people are looking at me like, what, Dalis, Daliso, D Diso? In South Africa, I'm the easiest to pronounce. Right, right. Yeah. Shucks, bro. And they, because I've never, I remember, even when I saw you on uh, Brit uh, Brit Britain's Got Talent. Yes. They said British has got talent. You've never seemed out of place because even no. in that competition, when I watch you perform, it's still you. And yes. And, and I actually, I've had so many people ask me for advice about doing it. And the one thing I always say is only do it if your set doesn't need to change. Right? If you are that person who talks, who swears and talks about religion and is very controversial you will not work and you will just be fighting with the producers because they'll be like, you can't say that, you can't say that. But like literally, I looked at my set and I was like, oh, I can do 80% of these jokes. Let's decide which ones to do. And so it worked wonderfully for me because I was also having more fun than you can imagine because I didn't think I was going to do that well. I did it. Do you know why I did it? I actually did it to get a professional video clip which I could use to get corporates, right? Because you know, if you want to get the good corporates, you need to have a TV clip, right? Like a professional TV clip. And my professional TV clip was me like six years ago, much thinner. I didn't even look like that guy anymore. When we achieve these things or when we get these things, we don't really like feel it right you know what i mean right right because it happens and then it's done and then it's kind of like your career i'll tell you the thing though is that britain's got talent is not a normal show mm -hmm. right i have friends who've done live at the apollo right uh so one of my best friends dane and people like that have done yeah. live at the apollo it's not the same right britain's got talent has got an absurd viewership right you know what i mean i have a video there which has a hundred million people have watched it yes. right so it's not the same as any other comedy TV. Literally, the day it aired, I couldn't sleep because my phone was ringing, right? The next day, I go to the grocery store. I think I'm famous because people are like, hey, it's you, hey, it's you, hey, it's you. Little kids, that's a big difference too, is little kids watch it, right? Mm. So to this day, years later, I'm walking down the street and little kids are like, 
You're the golden buzzer guy. You're the golden yeah, buzzer yeah, guy. Yeah, they yeah. don't remember your name, but it's stuck in their head. And it's weird. I don't know if it's because it's a competition and people are voting and they get really wrapped up and involved in it. Yeah. I think that they remember you in a way they don't if it's just a comedy special, mm. right? Because mm. I've done longer comedy specials and people still will remember me from the drama of the, you know, BGT also has that competition thing. And I don't know what it is, but yeah. they, it really makes a dent. And you, I literally felt it the day after it aired. And then after the semifinal, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Oh and for around a year, it was insane. And what then does that it, mean? No, what does that mean, bro? Because insane means insane means. insane means things like, okay, oh, the craziest was going back to Malawi, okay? Malawians have lost their minds, right? Malawians have been cheering. Malawians have been like, yeah, it was ridiculous. It was, ab it was wonderful, but it was also like, you know, Malawians don't have like a culture of celebrity. Like South Africa, I think, I think it's, you know, people will approach you. They'll say, hey, let's get a, 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 a photo or get a signature. And then they'll, no, here they just sit and talk. And at some point you have to tell them, okay, you have to force, because now they feel they're friends, they know you. I'll tell you the truth is it, reality shows are very fake fame. I mean, it's, it's, you can turn it into something sustainable, yeah. but the reason a lot of people get depressed in the long run is you are the most famous for a year. Mm. And then the new people come in, right? Gone. And it's not gone because you've set stuff up. So in that year, I got a radio show. In right. that year, I got some TV appearances. So you can build right. the sustainability, but people have a short memory with reality shows. It's all about the who's next, who's next, who's next. In the UK, there have been people who did Love Island, which is like a romantic one who like committed suicide because again, they were famous for a year and then they were normal, right? And the good thing, at least if you're a comedian, if you've got talents, you can turn it into something. Yeah. But it is a very dangerous roller coaster because if you start thinking it's you, not the, the show, Oh, I'll give you the perfect example. I told you that my tour, I can sell out 500s now, right? That wasn't true the first tour. The first tour, I was doing big ass rooms, big ass rooms. I was like, I'm famous. And then the second year, I did those big ass rooms and they weren't selling out, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh no, it's cause it was the show which people were coming for. Whoa. Now I'm seeing my real fans from those who just came because of the show. That's such so. an important point that you raise where you go, because as artists, we work on our thing so much where we get to a point where we're like, we are worthy and we can yes. do things. But then we don't put, we don't put as much uh, recognition for the work that the things around us do. Yes. So it's easy, you're right, where you go, I did this instead of, no, no, Simon Cowell's company and show. That's exactly it. And I think you can always know, it, it helps a lot to be like, if you, you know, when I did Kings and Queens of Comedy yeah, in South yeah, Africa, yeah, right? Yeah. And we, would, we did it at Emperor's and there were 10,000 people. I knew those 10,000 people weren't there for me. They were here for Basket Mouth. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like you've got to know why they've come. And it keeps, and one day, when they're coming for you, then you can be like, yeah, they're coming for me. But yeah, the problem is a lot of people start thinking they're coming for them before it's that. Right. What do you think, what do you think kept you sane? Like when you say, cause you had such huge su uh, success on the show. Yes. On the age, the age, because it happened to me at 37, not at 20. Right. So I was turning away these women. Well, not all of them, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Enough, enough, enough of them. You know what I mean? Like, like I was, I was not tempted by all these shiny things because I was already me. And also I had famous friends who I'd opened for and I'd seen the, the dangerous things. Right. And I'd seen, I'd also, I was just me and I knew what was important and what wasn't important. And I've got to tell you when I was 20, oh, I would have, I, I would be, I would be on Twitter making apologies right now. <laughs> Just <telling you. laughs> I did not make any bad decisions because I'm an adult. I'm a, I'm a me, I'm me. I'm fully formed. My <laughs> last question to you, how long have you been doing stand up? Oh my gosh. Half my life now. So, uh, I'm 40, so 20 years. So what's kept you just for people who are listening and act who kind of 
are listening to you for advice. Yeah. What has kept you doing this thing for 20 years? Honestly, I love jokes. I love, I love, I love them. Like literally, like if I'm not performing, I'm watching comedy, right? I'm, I'm reading about comedy. I, I love jokes, right? I watch comedians from the 1930s. I watch, com- like I, I, you know, I watch, I love all the comedy. I re- and I think that's the thing is, this is true for all arts. It's a hard road, right? There are gonna be some times when you can't pay your rent. There are gonna be some times when someone dumps you because they want an accountant or a, a programmer. Do you know what I mean? There are gonna be so many hard times, but you gotta love it because it's so much fun. And anytime I see someone who doesn't enjoy performing, I'm like, why are you even here? There are much better ways to make a living, right? You know what I mean? And, and I just love it. I love writing. And my favorite moment is when I've written a new idea, I do it in front of a crowd and they laugh. That, that little moment keeps me going. I think I'm gonna give you another question based on that. Yeah. You love jokes. How did you make a living for 20 years doing what you love? What doing what I'm doing. You, okay, like, well. How, like what? Cause I'm trying to give them the schematics of like. Okay, there were three phases. Phase one at the beginning of my career is I had other jobs and comedy was on the side. Right. Right. So I had, I was doing data entry, going in the evening comedy, cleaning, cleaning a bar in the weekends, evening doing comedy. Right. So that's phase one where you're not making enough of comedy. Tell me, tell me about just quickly about that period of being a comic where your time is split. Like what, Yes. what are, what, what, what are the emotions? What are the, well, for, the- for me, luckily, the beginning of it was I was a university student, mm-hmm. right? So that's when I started. So I'd spend all my time studying and then perform it in the evening. And then when I first started working, I had crappy jobs, like, you know, internships and j- jobs which weren't that time demanding right. that I could still do it. It's much harder if you've got like a good job which demands a lot of your time, but I had crappy jobs. Yeah. And I was lucky enough that by the time that I started making enough money that I could sort of go for it, I hadn't yet got a good job, <laughs> right? Because I honestly think if I had got a good job, which was demanding 10 hours of me a day, mm. I don't know if I would have had enough time to evolve as a comedian, mm. right? Mm. And then the next step was I was getting paid for comedy. I wasn't getting paid a lot, but I was lucky again because of, family, I was living in my brother's spare room. I didn't have to worry about rent. I just had to worry about getting to the gig, getting back from the gig, having a little money to eat and, you know, entertain, right? So that second period was really good because of the support of my brother. And then I was just doing it. And that was probably my most creative bit because I was gigging like a maniac. I was known in the UK as the person who never says no to a gig, right? You could call me like two hours before a gig. Someone's dropped out. Are you available? Yes, I'm on a train. I was just always there, always gigging. And that's when I got good. And that's when I became a headliner. And that's when I now had enough money to leave my brother's house. And now I was living okay to well, but not balling, right? Just, but living, like I used to say, I used to earn as much as like a teacher, right? Or like a f- entry level doctor, like first year, not like a doctor who's, you know, like, like depending on the year, you're doing okay. This is when I'd be coming down through essay doing, so it was doing comedy clubs and the occasional big show, whatever. And then I did Britain's Got Talent. And then it was the next phase where now I'm a touring comic where I'm living well, I have no problems, I'm happy, I've got a fan base, right? And then there's the next phase, which may be next year or two years, when I got a mansion, I got a Lamborghini, I'm rolling with bitches, that's the next phase. <laughs> and I'm not there yet, okay? Oh, <laughs> but man. you know what I mean? There are many different levels and each level have different challenges. Come on. Um, yeah. And this current challenge is the challenge, the big challenge right now is not going back because the dangerous thing is, you know, I told you that when I was in just a club comic, I was happy. I was actually happy. 
Wow. I wonder if I went backwards and I was a club comic again, if I would be happy because I've had a taste. Yeah. And it's very dangerous when you've had a taste of something more because you can't go back to the thing you liked. Yeah. You've got to maintain it. Yeah. 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 Bro, you are not going back because I'm you, not going back. <laughs> you've got your head on. You've got your head on straight, and that's and that's what I because what I what I'm what I'm hearing is you went through every yes. single phase. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes you know, you say you made a mistake in tour eight by staying with your agent, but no, it was the right out. choice. It was the right choice. And yeah. when I look back, not the right choice, but it was like. You know, I'm religious choice, and yeah. I feel like, you know, you, you believe that, you know, God gives you what you're ready to deal with. Right. I was not ready to deal with it then. You know, right? on paper, it made sense. I was not ready. I, I'm telling you, I would have an STD or something. I'm, I'm just, I know myself. I know myself. I was not ready for fame back then. Right. <laughs> I completely understand, bro. You yeah. have been an absolute pleasure to speak to. And it's been a delight. All best, dude, all of the best as you navigate your freaking career in this next. And when life returns, hopefully we'll be gigging together, not online somewhere. I would love that. I would oh, love that. Somewhere soon. The real Josie Festival will be back. Yeah, I see it. Make it happen. <laughs> All right, bro. Excellent. Adios. Daliso Chapon. Oh.